Well, good morning again. Uh, we're turning to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to do verses 16 through 25 today. Galatians 5, 16 through 25. I um, meant to announce it before. I will announce it now. And if I remember at the end of the service, that's even better. But just in case I forget, um, Chad Heckathorn uh, titled this morning's service, Sweet Corn Sunday. Um, and so if you came in and saw the car parked in the grass, um, that's inappropriate. Don't do that. But Chad, Chad's had got his truck parked out there in the grass full of sweet corn, and it's yours to take. He said, take as much as you can. He said, it's a really good opportunity to minister to your neighbors. Um, so um, I have had some the last couple days personally, and I would say you should get some and you should eat it. It's delightful. So um, on your way out this morning, grab sweet corn. And that is yours um, because it's Sweet Corn Sunday. We got Donut Sunday. We got Sweet Corn Sunday. When are we going to have T-Bone Sunday? (laughs) Yeah. Can you work on that, Greg? Okay. (laughs) All right. Galatians chapter 5. And this morning, we're continuing in our sermon series in Galatians. And if you've been with us for a while, we're actually in our 14th week. And some of you are like, what is wrong with this guy? And I would honestly don't know. But um, it's been really fun to preach through the word. I think it's been good for all of us. Um, And what's interesting about this morning is I feel like it is so overwhelmingly practical and so um, just obvious maybe that you may think like if you've never been here before, wow, that guy's kind of really hitting the application. Um, And so I would, uh, I guess, um, encourage you to read through Galatians 1 through 4. You don't have to listen to all the sermons, but uh, to get caught up with us because we're at a point in the sermon series where we can't really review all of it. Um, But we've reached this point in Paul's letter to the Galatians where he's shifted from doctrine to application. Like I said, he's been really heavy on doctrine. You've been saved by grace through faith. That's it. Grace alone, faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Um, But he's driving home the reality that the Christian life, the life that's rooted in Christ, is a a life marked by liberty. So last week we really hit um, kind of the main verse of Galatians. The Christian life is marked by freedom. Galatians 5.1, it says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. Well, that sounds good. What does that mean? It means that you were set free from your former life of slavery and to go and become a slave or something else, again, to something else, like the law would be a mistake. You were not set free for bondage. You were set free for freedom. We were slaves to sin, but in Christ we are children of God. Or you could say you were once a slave, but if you're a follower of Christ, now you're a son or a daughter. But here's something interesting. Paul writes about liberty often. He writes about freedom often. But when he does, every time he does, he always adds a warning that freedom can be easily lost. Well, how? How can it be easily lost? Well, by relapsing into bondage. Or by turning your liberty into license. Paul ended last week's passage that we studied with the verses from Galatians 5 verses 13 through 15. They say this, I put them on the screen. It says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Well, what is Paul emphasizing? He's emphasizing that true Christian liberty expresses itself. Here's how it expresses itself. If you are free in Christ, it expresses itself through self-control, loving service of our neighbor, and obedience to the law of God. The question that we get to answer today is, well, how is that possible I mean, he's been going against the law, but now he's saying that true Christian liberty expresses itself in these ways. How is it possible if it's not about just being law-abiding citizens? If freedom is all about those things, then how is self-control, loving service to our neighbor, and obedience to the law of God even possible? And I, I think that most, if not all of us, would say 
There's wisdom in loving and not fighting. But, but where do we get the strength to love when it's not natural for us? And, and where do we get the strength to not fight when that is the thing that we really want to do in our flesh? The answer is by the Holy Spirit. He alone can keep us truly free. So let's start by looking at verses 16 through 18 this morning. And if you're taking notes, and kids, if you have notes uh, this morning, you could, you could call this section the fact of Christian conflict. The fact of Christian conflict. And here's what verses 16 through 18 say. They say, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So these verses are really important for us because it is the, it's key here for us to recognize something. And that is this. If you're a Christian, there are two enemies in the Christian conflict. One is called the flesh, and the other is called the spirit. When Paul says the flesh, he means that by nature and inheritance, we are fallen humans. The flesh is more than physical. It's more than the body. It is the mind. It is the will. It is the emotions. It is all of a man or woman acting independently of God and against God in defiance to God. That is the flesh, just for a definition. It is what we are apart from the grace of God. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself who renews us and regenerates us. And more simply, what we could say here is that the flesh stands for what we are by birth and the Spirit what we become by new birth, the birth of the Spirit. So the flesh sets his desires against the Spirit and the Spirit is against the flesh. They are in complete opposition to one another. And they are locked in a constant struggle. He hear me on this. This is really important. There are two things that you need to know before we move forward. First, this is for those of us who are Christians. If you have put your faith in Christ, then the Holy Spirit is in you. So the first thing you need to know is this is for Christians. The spirit and the flesh are in conflict in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. And the second thing that you need to know is this, that as long as you are in this present life, you will be in conflict. You cannot escape it. Um, we've talked about sanctification before, but like if you are saved, right, at a point in time, and here is the day that you die. You are not fully sanctified and holy and without any sort of flesh fighting against you until you're not breathing anymore. Okay? And some of you are like, wow, thank you for the good news, Robbie. But I, I do think it is good news. God is making us holy along this continuum of sanctification. And it is not linear, even though I showed you in a linear way. We go up sometimes, we go down, we are fighting against our flesh. I think it is important for us to recognize that, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the flesh are battling each other. You will not be totally holy and sanctified until you are dead. Don't put that in your notes. We cannot live totally above the conflict of the flesh and the Spirit. And people have tried it through history. They have thought that it would, that they could have, had it uh, gotten away from temptations of the world and that they would gain an upper hand and that they would be able to prevail against the flesh. There were actually, um, I remember in a church history class um, in college that the early monks would leave their urban areas, their cities, to live in deserts alone in caves and in mountains. And there's a, a famous monk named uh, Jerome. He was a contemporary of Augustine. And he went into the wilderness where the days were hot and the nights were cold. And there were only scorpions and wild animals for company, and he hoped to escape the lurid temptations of the city, but guess what? He didn't. He wrote that even there, living in complete isolation, he imagined himself among the dancing girls of Rome. His words, not mine. 
He said, my face, this is his writing, my face was pale from fasting, my mind burned with passionate desires within my freezing body, he writes. So a man can take himself out of the fight or out of the city, but he cannot take the fight out of himself because the flesh and the spirit are at odds with each other. Some teachers would say that the Christian has no inner conflict, no civil war within. They would say that the flesh has been eradicated and that the old nature is dead. And I want to say to you that Paul would beg to differ. Read these verses. Actually, this passage, and if you go to Romans chapter 7, would go against that wholeheartedly. It's not good teaching to say if you've come to faith, you won't have to battle your flesh at all. Here's the danger that the Galatians and you and I face. We can hear this and we can either become complacent about it or we can think that we can manage it on our own strength and with techniques and with rules and with to-do lists. And the flesh is too strong for us to battle. Hear me clearly on this, though. We are not always doomed to failure The battle is not a stalemate because as we walk by the Spirit, we will see victory in our lives. We will see victory over the flesh when we walk by the Spirit. So the urgency of this situation is this. You are in a battle and you need to look to the Holy Spirit. This is the Christian life. This is freedom. Walking in the Spirit is freedom. So Paul sets the baseline here that there is this reality to the Christian life That is that there is conflict within. The flesh is against the spirit and Paul creates that baseline and then he moves into the kind of behavior that both natures produce. Just in case his audience wasn't clear, he's going to say, well, this is what the flesh produces and this is what the Holy Spirit produces. So what does the flesh produce? Works of the flesh. Here they are, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envies, drunkenness, orgies. And then he says, and things like these. So it's not an exhaustive list. He's kind of like, if you're like, I don't have any of those. He's like, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul says, in case you're wondering what the works of the flesh are, they're evident. They're obvious to all. The flesh itself is invisible. It's not like a person walking around and you're like, hey, flesh, how are you doing today? It is in you. But the works of the flesh are obvious. And we we know that. We know that. The flesh itself is invisible, but the works of the flesh are public and evident. Well, what are they? Well, let's start with this. This isn't an exhaustive list, like I said, but but, uh, those things that Paul does include can fall into four different categories this morning. The first category is the category of sex. The second is religion. The third is sins of society. And the fourth is, I'm just putting it under drink. The first category, the sexual sins, include immorality, impurity, sensuality, and these listed first are not listed first because they are the worst. I think because they are the most obvious, and that's why he lists them first. You have to understand the context he lived in, and honestly, I feel like America or the Western culture or maybe just the world can understand today this context better than almost any of the other things. And that is in the Greek and Roman world in which Paul lived, they were notorious for immorality. In fact, immorality was so common that unless it was carried to excess, it wasn't considered bad. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So we can kind of relate there. The second category is from the religious realm. The flesh is more than just our desires physically, our sexual desires. The flesh is a very broad term. And so Paul points to idolatry and sorcery. And I I would personally say that this is one of the, the ones that most of us think that we're all good in because we don't have a wooden idol at home. Oh, I don't deal with idolatry or sorcery. But it's bigger than that, and I I find that one of our modern-day idols can be sports. Now, I love sports. 
But too many believers don't have time to study the Bible or fellowship with other believers because they or their children are pursuing athletics. Let me just say this. If I stepped on your toes, I would encourage you to keep in shape. I would encourage you to cheer for your kids. But if we forsake knowing Christ and worshiping him and studying the word to do so, we might be guilty of idolatry. And then the third category is made up of social sins or the sins that we commit against each other in society like enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. These are problems that arise from pride and greed and selfish ambition. And then the fourth category is connected to alcohol abuse, but really not just alcohol. It's just abuse of stuff. You could even throw food into this category. But go get your sweet corn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, it's broader than drunkenness. Martin Luther said this. He said, Paul does not say that eating and drinking are works of the flesh, but intemperance in eating and drinking, which is a common vice today. It is a work of the flesh. Those who are given to excess are to know that they are not spiritual but carnal. So Paul says, I'm telling you again that those who are involved in these things will not inherit the kingdom. And you might say, well, that sounds like legalism. I thought we were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And now he's saying if you're involved in these things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom. I thought you preached against that, Robbie. I thought Paul was against that. And I would say this. Here's why it's not legalism. This is revelation. And, and hear me on this. The works of the flesh in your life and in mine reveal an absence of relationship with the Lord. It's a test. Hear me very clearly on this. Paul is not speaking to the person who struggles with these things or who has fallen into these things. He is speaking to the one who perpetually, habitually practices these things arrogantly, practices them stubbornly, and with no desire to be set free from them. People who have a mindset or a heart attitude that says, I'm free to do whatever I want because I have a get out of jail free card, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because, and here is the key, the flesh and the spirit are not at war within that person, which can only mean one thing. Wise is the person who takes Paul's words at face value and says, Lord, give, forgive me and help me. Cause me to be full of your spirit. So those are the works of the flesh. And then he moves into a section that we're just going to call the works of the spirit, or you could call them the fruit of the spirit. We saw that the works of the flesh were those things we listed before. What are the works of the spirit? Well, here they are um, in verses 23 and 24. Nope, 22 and 23. They say this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So let's start first here with notice the, um, the word fruit. It is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. Why is it not plural, and why does that matter? Well, because the Spirit works in all of these things, and when the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you cannot say, well, I'm really good at love, but I'm really kind of working on peace. Or I have a ton of joy, but the kindness thing I'm sort of trying to get caught up on. The fruit of the Spirit, they all work together. It is fruit from the Holy Spirit, not fruits. And also, you cannot only have love and not have peace and patience and kindness. Patience does not exist without self-control, right? So it's not more of one and less of the other. It is, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is leading your life. All of these things. It's not like a spiritual gift where you're like, I have the spiritual gift of love, but I don't have the spiritual gift of self-control. <laughs> it's just, sorry. Um, 
So they're not individually packaged fruits, and I think that's important. They are the fruit of the Spirit. Another interesting thing about the fruit of the Spirit is that these virtues seem to expose the Christian's attitude towards three things. The Christian's attitude towards God, the Christian's attitude towards other, and then the others, and then the Christian's attitude towards themselves. Love, joy, and peace manifest in the area of Christian relationship to God. Love is a supernatural love which causes the follower of Christ to love God first and to manifest this love to others. Joy is the inward elation of having a personal relationship with God through Christ, which manifests itself in a joyful attitude towards serving God and others. And peace is that inward serenity and confidence that God has all things under control, and this manifests itself in a peaceful attitude towards others. It is what Paul was praying for when he said, um, I, uh, that the, I'm sorry, um, that the peace of God would guard your heart. That's what it means. It's peace. It's something supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit. Patience, kindness, and goodness all manifest through the Holy Spirit in the areas of Christian relationship to other people. Patience is self-restraint, which does not retaliate when others hurt you or disappoint you. Kindness is to be understanding and sympathetic towards others, not having a warlike or irritable attitude. Goodness is a kindly disposition towards others with a generous attitude. And faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are manifest through the Spirit in the areas of Christian relationship to themselves. Faithfulness is a person's honesty towards others and their reliability as a Christian. They fulfill their word and they keep their commitments. They can be trusted. Gentleness is a humility which manifests itself in consideration and courtesy towards others. Self-control is a master of selfish goals and desires so as to have a godly life before others. And so the primary direction of love, joy, and peace is towards God, of patience, kindness, and goodness is towards others, and of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is towards ourselves. And all of these are the fruit of the Spirit. These naturally appear in the lives of the Spirit-led Christians. So what does Paul say then, or why does Paul say that against such thing there there is no law? Well, because the function of the law is to curb, it is to restrain, and it is to deter. And there is no deterrent needed in the fruit of the Spirit. Nobody says to you, quit being so loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good. The reason that Paul separates the works of the flesh... And the reason that he separates the works of the Spirit is the same reason that we went through both of them separately this morning. Because you could be asking, like, why are you doing this? And it is to make it clear that these two parts of us are in active conflict to one another. The two do not work together. And the result of this active conflict is that the flesh will, verse 17, we already read it, the flesh will keep you from doing the things you want to do. Can anyone relate to this or is it just like me? I mean, there's this constant battle. I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. It's Romans chapter 7 if you want to read it. Paul said it. Here's the thing. I imagine that if you looked at both of these lists side by side, we'll throw them on the screen real quick here this morning. If you looked at both of them side by side, nobody I, don't, I can't think of anyone that would be like, yeah, I'd really like to have the works of the flesh over the fruit of the Spirit. Works of the flesh sound better. That sounds like a good life. I, it's not even a, an awesome list. We want the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we want. Sometimes we're like, oh man, the Bible's so restrictive. No, it's not. How awesome would that be? Nobody looks at the two lists and says, I want to have the works of the flesh. That sounds good to me. And that's why Paul says in Romans 7, 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want, it's what I keep doing. I want the good. I want the freedom. This is the Christian conflict. It is fierce. It is bitter. It is unrelenting. And here's the reality by ourselves the Christian cannot be victorious. And you're probably like, is that the whole story, Robbie? <laughs> that's, not, that's depressing. Paul, you're depressing the Galatian churches. What are you doing here? 
Well, he answers that question in verses 24 through 25 because he gives us the way to Christian victory. And here it is. Verses 24 and 25. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So Paul gives two ways to have Christian victory in these two verses. And the first one is crucify the flesh. And the second one is walk by the Spirit. Crucify the flesh, walk by the Spirit. It's important to notice here that the crucifixion of the flesh here is something that is not done to us, but it is done by us. It would be a mistake to believe that this verse in Galatians teaches the exact same thing we studied in Galatians 2.20, which said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? This is a different thing here. In Galatians 2.20 or in Romans 6.6, we're taught that by faith in Christ, we have been crucified with Christ. But here in verse 24, it is us who have taken the action, We are to deliberately put to death our flesh. And I want you to hear me very clearly on this. Dallas Willard said it. Grace is opposed to earning. You cannot earn your salvation, but it is not opposed to our effort. It's not opposed to your effort. So what does that mean? What is Paul saying? When Paul uses crucifixion to describe what we are to do to our flesh, I think of what Jesus said himself in verses, uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and do what? Take up his cross and follow me. This is from Jesus himself. To take up the cross means self-denial. Paul takes the metaphor to its logical conclusion. He must not only take up the cross and walk with it, but actually see that the execution happens. We are actually to take the flesh, our deliberate and rebellious self, and metaphorically speaking, nail it to the cross of Jesus Christ. This is how Paul would graphically describe repentance. He would say it is turning our back on the old life, of selfishness and sin. And I think it's important to remember, what does the flesh give us? This is why we crucify it. It's yucky. I think this teaching is neglected in the church, and it's probably because it's hard to hear. And it's not that fun to preach. But the first and greatest secret to your freedom and your holiness lies in the degree of your repentance. We have to repent of our sins. If you and I are plagued by sin, if our sin is persistent, it is either because we have never truly repented of it or because having repented, we have not maintained repentance. We've nailed our old nature to the cross, but we keep going back to the scene of its execution and we're like, oh, well, I'm like, 10 years into this and I'm totally comfortable now around the thing that used to cause me to sin and we go back and we check out the scene of the execution. Declaring war on your flesh means that you are not going to go back to it and resume negotiations. Second thing that Paul tells us is that we have to walk by the Spirit. We'll look at verse 18 again. It says this, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So the Spirit leads us, right? But now look at verse 25. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also do what? Walk by the Spirit. So it's the Spirit who does the leading, but we do the walking. The Holy Spirit takes initiative. He declares his desires against the flesh and forms within us holy and heavenly desires. He puts his gentle pressure on us, and we have to yield to his direction and his control. But it would be a great mistake for you and for I today to think that our only duty is to be passively submissive to the Spirit's control. Because we're to walk. What is the path we walk in? We walk in the Holy Spirit. He shows us the way we walk in that way. It is not enough to yield passively to the Spirit's control. We have to walk actively in the Spirit's way. When we do, the fruit of the Spirit will appear simply, or walking simply means doing what the Lord tells us to moment by moment. And you may be saying, okay, Robbie, I, I get it. 
There's a war inside of me, the Holy Spirit in my flesh. I get it. In fact, I will even grant you that because I feel it. I feel this desire to honor God, but I keep returning to my flesh. How do I move forward and walk by the Spirit? Give me something practical. I'm going to give you two things this morning and the worship team can come on up. The, the first thing I would say is feed on the word of God. I know you've heard me say this before, and sometimes it's just like, yeah, but aren't we a Holy Spirit people? Shouldn't we just be led and just know what to do? And guys, God gave us the word. To walk by the spirit means we walk by faith. And when we hear the word of God and respond to it with trust, God pours out his spirit into our lives in an increased way. So we have to feed on the word of God by faith. The word of God is food for our souls. What I know from my own life and what I know from counseling people, it's been confirmed, is that unless we are feeding upon the word of God, we will not experience the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. I know it feels strong, but God has chosen to honor his son by joining the giving of the Holy Spirit to the receiving of the word of Christ. This is the God-appointed means to being filled with the Spirit. As the Word of Christ dwells in us richly from Colossians, we will find that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the result is the same. What happens when we go to the Word? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. We will not be able to walk by the Spirit and enjoy the freedom and empowering presence of the Spirit in our daily life if we are not feeding upon the promises of the Word of God, Scripture, on a daily basis. That's where we get to know Jesus. We have to read the Bible on a daily basis. Otherwise, we will not or really cannot walk by the Spirit in our daily life. Feed on the word. And you might say, Robbie, that's easy for you to say. That's your job. Well, let me tell you, when I get here, it's not easy for me to study the Bible. I study for my sermons, but it's not easy for me to feed on it. I have to be intentional every morning to be up before my kids and read it before I come here. It doesn't matter if it's my job. We walk with and keep in step with the spirit when we feed on the word. One more thing on how we can walk with and keep in step with the Spirit, and I think there are probably lots of them, but here it is. You, and this one, I couldn't come up with a good way to put it in your notes, but you cannot compartmentalize walking in the Spirit. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, Well, let me explain. In our lives, we tend to give the Holy Spirit his hour, or maybe a couple of hours when we're at church, right? I really want to walk away from the flesh, we say, I don't want to operate in the flesh. I want to operate with these fruit of the spirit. I really want to have the fruit of the spirit, we say, but if I let him lead my life at work, I might be different. Or if I bring my spirit-led life to school, then I'll be called a weirdo. And what we end up doing, and it's totally acceptable in our culture, is that we compartmentalize when we walk by the spirit or when we ask the Holy Spirit to lead our lives. And when we walk the way that everybody else walks. Here's the thing, like if you want to walk by the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has to have bearing on all of the areas of your life. We cannot compartmentalize like, this is who I am at Hillside, this is who I am somewhere else. He has to have bearing on how you work. He has to have bearing on where you go. He has to have bearing on what you buy. He has to have bearing on who you see, on what you say. But many of us, while we are excellent in church, and myself included, we are horrible followers of Christ when it comes to other places. Well, how do we keep in step with the Spirit? We walk by the Spirit. We follow the Spirit. We are a people that see everything in the world through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ everything and we say holy spirit lead me you lead me and then we walk in the way he leads us it's a really tough thing to explain when the spirit prompts you and you move into it but i think that if we're led by the spirit we can do that 
The most impacting, exciting, and free life there is, is a life in the Spirit. Do you want to walk in the Spirit? Do you want to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Do you want to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Well, then you need to feed on the Word, and you cannot compartmentalize your life. I want to say one other thing this morning that's not in my notes, but I think that it's also very key when we say, I want to walk away from the flesh, and I need help. Guys, we're in community, aren't we? And we've said this before here, but it's so easy to be like, yeah, those are my church friends. And then on the weekends, I do stuff with other friends. And then we walk away from other friends who we we love and we want to know Christ. But we're like, man, I just operated in my flesh this entire weekend because of those people. We have to help each other. We have to be asking each other, are you feeding on the word? Are you walking by the spirit? How do we do it on our own? God didn't give us the church for us to all leave this place and go try and be these things by ourselves. Feed on the word. Do not compartmentalize your life. Everything we do should be in response to the Spirit's leading, and we should do it as a community. Here's what I would tell you guys. Maybe it's a dare. I don't know. I would ask you guys to do this morning is what I would say, even as we're worshiping at the end here, is ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, he will. And by faith, respond to his leading. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word again this morning. God, I know that it feels like today was more like, um, here's what you are when you're bad and here's what you are when you're good. And Lord, I just pray that we can sift through all that stuff and know that you have given us your Holy Spirit. He will lead us and the produce is fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. God, I pray that as a church, we would experience that in the lives of our friends. We would experience that. Lord, would you help us in that direction? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.